And I trust we're all humbly thankful to the Lord for the privilege, privilege of assembling in his house tonight. We appreciate you and your presence, and we trust above all that we have the Lord's presence. And I was thinking a number, of, uh, a few minutes ago, several minutes ago, of uh, the uh, good number of ministers that have turned out for these services. I've not kept count of them, but I suppose if it were all totaled up, it's been a good representation of the brethren from this section of the country. And we're always pleased to be in the presence of our preacher brethren. So we appreciate those of you that have come several miles. So will you please pray for us that the Lord would uh, lead us in the way that he would have us to go. Bible readers are very well aware that the main theme of the 10th and 11th chapters of Romans is how that the nation Israel lost the blessings of the New Covenant Church, or the church that Jesus built. They lost the, lost the blessings of the gospel, and these things were given to Gentile people such as we are. In Romans chapter 11, the Apostle Paul warns Gentiles such as we are not to become arrogant or lifted up in our conceits, but rather to be humble before God. And in Romans chapter 11, verse 22, he says, Behold thou therefore the goodness and severity of God. He says, To them which fell severity, that is, to the nation Israel. He said, Here's an example of the severity of God. Because even though God had loved this nation above the other nations of the earth, when we consider the judgments and chastisements of God that came upon this people here in time, here's an example of the severity of God. He says, Behold thou therefore the goodness and severity of God. He said, Toward them which fell, Israel. He said severity, but he said toward thee, toward you Gentile peoples who don't deserve it, he said goodness. The main thing I want you to notice about that passage of Scripture, that passage of Scripture says that there's two things about the Lord that we're to behold constantly. We're to constantly behold the goodness and severity of God. Now that does not say that I'm to constantly behold the goodness of God. It tells me that I'm not to develop a lopsided view of God. And I say it with all the kindness that my gruff voice can put together. If the Lord will bless me to preach what I have on my mind tonight, I am probably in the midst of the only type of people in America, or yea, the civilized world, that will receive what I've got on my mind. And I say this in all kindness. Uh, but it takes a people who believe in the sovereignty of God and the depravity of man and salvation by grace and grace alone to receive what I have on my mind tonight if the Lord blesses me to deliver it. Because <clears throat> what I'm about to say to you is totally cross grain it's totally contrary to the conception or idea of God that the overwhelming majority of people on this earth have. This text tells me that I am to behold not only the goodness of God, but the severity of God. And in the minds of many people, and I say this in reverential fear, uh, <clears throat> God up in heaven is nothing but an overindulgent grandfather who has armloads of goodies for his people, but who would not dare uh, chastise or punish or make you uncomfortable in this life. The view that many people have of God in heaven is that God is a Santa Claus up in glory with blessings, or that he's an overindulgent grandfather who would not dare chastise his children. And I remember the lines of a popular hymn a number of years ago, the chorus went this way, though it makes him sad to see the way we live, he'll always say, I forgive. Uh, that might have uh, made a popular song, but it's not true according to the Bible. Because in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 20, there was a time when the long-suffering of God came to an end with that war before the flood. It says, when once in the days of Noah, the long-suffering of God waited while the ark was preparing. But the long-suffering of God came to an end. There was a time about 600 years before the birth of Christ that the long-suffering of God came to an end with the nation Israel. And Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian army came upon them and carried them away into 70 years' captivity. Then God in his mercy allowed them to be brought back into their land, and we have several hundred years of idolatry. And uh, <clears throat> then John the Baptist went among them. Then the Son of God preached among them for three and a half years. Then the apostles preached among them for seven, uh, several years. Then finally, <clears throat> the long-suffering of God with that people came to an end once again. In the year AD 70, the Roman army surrounded Jerusalem, and in a siege that lasted about four months, 1,100,000 people were killed and 97,000 led into captivity. That does not sound like a God that would say, though it makes me sad to see the way you live, I'll always say I forgive. There are times in the, in the Bible, though God is a God of patience and a God of long-suffering, that as his people, uh, we can try that patience and bring the judgments and chastisement of God down upon us here in this present world. Uh, the Apostle Paul says, I am to behold not only the goodness of God, but also the severity of God. 
If it's God's will tonight, I'd like to talk to you on the subject of the hatred of God. You might say, oh, no, there's no such thing in the Bible because the Bible says God is love. Yes, the Bible says God is love. I've read that myself. But the same Bible that says that God is love tells us about things in the world that God hates. And uh, God willing, uh, you know, there's a right way to start a nail. You know, you point it in the right direction and pound on it. And sometimes there's a right way and a wrong way to start a subject. So to start with tonight, uh, I'm going to try to establish, if you'll pray for me and give me your attention, and God will give me the strength, I'm going to establish by the Scriptures that there are things in the world that God hates. And uh, if somehow we can get folks to see that there are things in the world that God hates, then I'm going to try you on something else. <clears throat> if I can get that past you, I'm going to try you on something else. We're going to find that there are doctrines and teachings in the world that God hates. And then if I can get that by you, I'm going to put you to the supreme test, and we'll wait and see what that one is. Uh, the same Bible that says that God is a God of love also teaches that he is a jealous God. It teaches us that he's a God of wrath. And I say this tonight in all the reverential fear that I can possibly muster. You can go back in history, and <clears throat> you can show me, we can talk about what the most wicked and deranged men that have ever lived on earth have done. I mean, talk to me about Genghis Khan. Talk to me about Adolf Hitler and the atrocities of World War II. Uh, <clears throat> let's talk about the Spanish Inquisition. Let's talk about wicked and brutal men in the past uh, <clears throat> that have vented their wrath on fellow human beings. And when you get through with all that, <clears throat> that is nothing to be compared with the wrath of God when it has been unleashed upon this wicked world. I think you all amen that myself. Uh, find me a Hitler, find me a Roman emperor, find me a madman in the past that ever sent fire down from heaven and burned up entire cities. Find me a madman in the past, a Hitler, uh, uh, find me a Genghis Khan, find me a Roman emperor, find me somebody that flooded an entire world and destroyed everything on it except eight people and the animals that were in the ark. Find me that. Uh, as I go back to the text one more time, uh, behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God. I've heard a lot of songs about the goodness of God. How many songs do you ever hear about the severity of God? I've read a lot of poems about the goodness of God. How many of you ever read about the severity and wrath of God? I've heard lots of sermons in my lifetime about the love of God. How many sermons do you ever hear on the hatred of God? <laughs> but the Bible teaches us that the hatred of God, the severity and wrath of God is a fact. You say, well, I don't hear that. I don't draw any comfort from that. Well, maybe you will by the time I get through. Uh, the Lord never called me or anybody else to preach a lopsided gospel. He said, I'm to behold the goodness and severity of God. When we begin to think about the hatred of God, the Bible is crystal clear that there are things in this world that God hates. Uh, now, let's don't just let that go by us. Let's stop and think about that a minute. It's a dangerous thing to go through life doing things that people hate. I mean, you can go through life doing things that people hate. They'll set fire to your pasture. Uh, they'll sabotage your equipment. I mean, people retaliate. They'll do things against you. Uh, there are some groups of people in America that when my wife and I, my wife came up in the deep south, and <clears throat> I've been in the south most of my life. There are groups of people uh, in this nation. Uh, my wife and I and everybody else had names for them. And those folks back then didn't mind those names. Uh, today, those folks hate those names. And if you want to bring down the hatred and the retaliation of those folks, you call them by those names. Uh, and I don't have to spell this out for you, do I? Uh, <clears throat> you've got some folks out in this portion of Texas I never did have to rub shoulders with much, and they've got some names they don't like to be called. Hint of the wise sufficient. Uh, <clears throat> now, you can, go, you can go through life calling folks by certain names and bring down their judgment and wrath on you, get your tires slashed. I mean... It's a dangerous thing to go through life doing things that men hate. But have you ever pondered the seriousness of doing something that God hates? Now, uh, you might be able to hide, you might be able to do things that men hate and do it under cover of darkness nobody know who's doing it. You might be able to do things that men hate and cause somebody else to get the blame. You might be able to do something that man hates and find refuge in some other part of the world. But when you're doing something that God hates, there's no hiding from God. I was in a home several years ago, a long time ago. I, was, uh, I believe I was uh, maybe a teenager uh, <clears throat> around uh, in my later teens. 
And the ladies had left the room. There's one brother spoke out, and he said, now if the sisters have left the room, he had something he wanted to tell. There's one brother there said, uh, the sisters may have left the room, but said the, the Holy Spirit hadn't left the room. I like that one to this day. Yeah, I like that one. Now, the sisters may leave the room, the children may leave the room, but you can be sure God never leaves it. Now, listen. Uh, <clears throat> there's no such thing as fleeing from the presence of God. Uh, David says, I make my barren hell, thou art there. Uh, if I take the wings of the morning, go to the uttermost parts of the sea, says, thou art there. There's no escaping. <clears throat> there's no hiding from an omnipresent God. <clears throat> I want to let that soak in just a minute. Think about doing something God hates. But we turn to Proverbs chapter 6, verse 16 and 17. And these passages of Scripture say, These six things that the Lord hate, yea, seven, are abomination to him. And right at, the, right at the very top of the list, you say, Oh, well, these are probably things that the unregenerate, non-elect, wicked of this world commit. Oh, no, I'm going to prove to you tonight that you're capable of doing every one of them. And we start out here, and you know what heads the list? When uh, God gives the list of things he hates, you know what he puts right up the head of the list? You say, well, surely a child molester, a rapist, I mean, uh, <clears throat> undoubtedly a fornicator, a murderer, an adulterer, surely something like that, oh, no. Uh, when God topped off the list of things he hates, at the very top of the list, he said, I hate a proud look. You say, well, I've got my pride. Sorry, God hates it. He said, a proud look. I hate a proud look. You know, <clears throat> What, you ever wonder why pride heads the list? Uh, it was pride that opened the door for the first sin that ever came into this earth, or, or came into this world. First of all, it was pride on the part of Satan <clears throat> that caused him uh, <clears throat> to go against what the Creator said in the Garden of Eden. It was also pride on the part of Adam, because watch this, God had all, already told him. Of the trees of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, not the tree of good and evil, the tree of knowledge of it. Uh, a man to this day makes a God out of knowledge. Uh, it was that knowledge he went after. Now, uh, folks do not like to believe there's some knowledge being withheld from them. And I've said this lots of times. Uh, I'm not as scared of a hollering person as I am a whispering person. Uh, I'd hold up somebody somebody get out here and holler in the street, Sonny Piles is a drunkard, Sonny Piles is a thief, Sonny Piles is this, hear ye, hear ye. Uh, I'd hold up rather somebody do that than somebody be going around whispering it. Because I remember when I was a youngster in the old south, on Saturday there'd be a preacher down on the square hollering at the top of his lungs. Nobody listened to him. But if somebody slipped through the crowd whispered, hey, have you heard the story on the sheriff, you know, and uh, so-and-so's wife? Everybody listens. Um, somebody could be out there in the street right now hollering, you don't have to go out and listen to them. Uh, but if somebody starts going through the lunchroom tonight doing this, you've got to get in on it. You know why? Because you feel like there's some knowledge being withheld from you. You know what I'm talking about? Sure you do. The guilty looks is on your face. The guilty looks on your face. You're reading me real clear, aren't you? Uh, <clears throat> we don't like the idea that something's being withheld from us. We want to be right in the big middle of things. Uh, <clears throat> it was pride that caused Adam to sin. It was pride that caused Satan to tempt him. And by the way, while we're on this, we come to 1 Timothy chapter 3, and the Apostle Paul gives a rule over here pertaining to the ordination of ministers that our people are violating right and left all over this country, and we're suffering for it. The Bible plainly tells us that the man we're ordained is not a novice. That means one newly come to the faith. Not a novice. Why? <clears throat> Less being lifted up with pride. Why? He come into the condemnation of the devil. And... <clears throat> Uh, may I say this? Well, I'm going well, to say it where I may or not. You throw, you throw a rock at me. I've heard Primitive Baptist during the 40 years I've been with them rare back and bombastically say the office of the ministry is the highest office on earth. The preaching of the gospel is the highest work a man can do. You really believe that? <clears throat> if you do, I'll ask you some questions. It takes about four years to become a school teacher. It takes a certain amount of time to be a barber. It takes a certain amount of time to be a mortician. Four years to be a school teacher. Uh, about two or three more to be a lawyer. Add something to that to be a doctor. Uh, <clears throat> takes four years to uh, learn to be a school teacher. I could talk about some other professions. Might take a year or two years. Uh, <clears throat> if it takes four years to prepare and qualify yourself for those fields, uh, <clears throat> then don't tell me that some newcomer to the faith who's been introduced to services for three or four months is ready to be ordained. They're not. You're getting quiet in here. They're not. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, they're not ready. Uh, I don't care how well they can preach. You say, well, we've got a little fellow over here only belong to the church three months. <clears throat> he knows more Bible than you do. Maybe that's true. But I'll tell you something. 
He doesn't know. He doesn't know human nature. <coughs> he doesn't know old Baptist lingo. Uh, he's not experienced enough to teach God's people. My friends, he says, not a novice, not one newly come to the faith. And I say this tonight in all kindness. When men come to us for, from other orders, their experience from, with other orders does not count. They can sit on the cooling board and prove their gifts just like everybody else. <clears throat> I mean, here's a Primitive Baptist homegrown brother coming up out of the patch. I mean, uh, just an old Primitive Baptist moss back, you know, coming up out of the patch. <clears throat> he proves his gift. Here's a man been preaching for another group, so you can prove your gift. He says, not a novice, not less being lifted up with pride. You know what's going to happen if you take that little fella and you ordain him in a year or two? You know what's going to happen to him? Uh, this goes through his mind. Uh, <clears throat> I haven't belonged to the church but a year or two, and now I'm a church leader. <clears throat> Look how far I have come so fast. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, there's folks out here in the church belong to the church uh, 20 or 30 years, and they're not in the ministry. I've only been a member a year or two, and look where I am. In fact, I could name you one <clears throat> that lately has gotten into a lot of trouble, uh, <clears throat> gotten into lots of trouble. Uh, I was talking to some deacons uh, about, uh, say, 10 months ago, uh, before he got into trouble, <clears throat> literally did this, put his suspenders out and said, and look where I am now. <clears throat> How do you like that? <clears throat> That's somebody being lifted up with pride. Somebody being lifted up with pride. This book says God hates a proud look. And when you get on the subject of pride, <clears throat> when you find somebody that's too proud to say I made a mistake, somebody's too proud to say this is my fault, uh, <clears throat> somebody to say that uh, <clears throat> this thing that's happened uh, is my fault. This person's not looking for a scapegoat. They're willing to take the blame. Uh, there's a cover, uh, September 23rd. I don't get started on this because there's a whole sermon in this one. Cover article, September 23rd, <clears throat> leading magazine. I believe it's time. I've got it anyway. Cover article says, <clears throat> the American people are becoming a nation of busybodies and crybabies. Well, that's right. Because in, the nation, in our nation right now, the trend today <clears throat> is if you have any problems in life, if you have any disappointments in life, find somebody to blame. Go into any big bookstore. Uh, <clears throat> the big kick today is blame your parents. Go into the bookstores. Uh, here are the books, Children of Toxic Parents, Children of Alcoholics, uh, Releasing the Child Within, uh, you know, Getting Rid of Your Anger. In other words, that's blaming your parents. That's the big kicker today in counseling and psychology is for me to examine you and any problems you have today are, some, are bound to be the fault of your parents. <clears throat> if, you don't, if you can't blame your parents, uh, blame your environment, blame society, blame somebody. You know, instead of taking it on the chin, blame somebody. Uh, blame the government because they don't give you <coughs> a big enough welfare check. Blame the color of your skin. I want to tell you something that's uh, strange to me. We have people of certain groups <coughs> that come into this nation and four or five generations later they're still in the ghetto drawing welfare. We have Asian people come into this nation with the shirts on their backs. And in no time, they're running businesses, and they're getting master's degrees and doctorates. Isn't that strange? Uh, <clears throat> when my son was at Oklahoma State, he taught doctoral level students, 60% of whom were foreigners, mostly Asians. Well, those people don't have white skin. <clears throat> and they come into this nation with slant eyes and the shirts on their backs. But the next thing you know, they're your medical doctors. They're running your business. You know why? Uh, <clears throat> there's something more involved here than skin color. Uh, you can't sit back forever and suck your thumb and blame the color of your skin. Uh, this is a nation of crybabies. <clears throat> We're also a nation of busybodies. And when I read that article, I said, that describes the Primitive Baptist ministry in 1991 pretty well, because all over this nation I find busybodies and I find crybabies. I'm uh, glad you came, aren't you? I can tell already. What's this? <clears throat> he says, <clears throat> these six things that the Lord hates at the top of the list is a proud look. My friends, I hope all of us will examine ourselves and that we'll be big enough to say uh, that there's some of the problems I have in this life are because I made some bad choices. Uh, some of the problems I have in this life, are we big enough to say this, I made some bad choices? Uh, <clears throat> I've lost some friends back in the past because I shot my mouth off. Uh, <clears throat> a lot of this is my fault. Are we bi as big as that prodigal in the 15th chapter of Luke that comes back to the Father and says, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight? First thing God put on his list of things he hates <coughs> is a proud look. <clears throat> you say, well, uh, we can't afford it. 
Uh, but we're going to put on a $15,000 wedding production for our daughter uh, because my sister or my sister-in-law put on one for theirs. Uh, what's your driving motivating factor here? Uh, you want to make a better marriage out of it? Is that your factor? No, your factor is pride, isn't it? Uh, that's what it is, isn't it? Pride. Uh, that first thing on God's list, he said, I hate a proud look. When you go down that list of things that God hates, he said, I hate a proud look, I hate a lying tongue. And we're living in a nation today where lying is not looked upon as seriously as it used to be. There was a time in this country, you don't have to be old to remember it, when a man's word was his bond. Uh, some of you farmers here remember all kinds of transactions that were made, no papers ever written up. Uh, a man told you he'd deliver something for so much, you could count on it. Uh, today you better get it, get it on the dotted line, have plenty of witnesses and hope. <clears throat> because we're a people today that have been lied to by presidents in the past. <clears throat> we're lied to most every day in the news media. Most advertising in America today it has got lying in it. You ought to drink Folgers coffee because it's mountain grown. Fine, coffee won't grow anywhere else. It's all mountain grown. <clears throat> Here's a certain product. You ought to <clears throat> yeah, eat this product because it's fat free. You know what that means? They're giving you the fat. They're charging you for the other ingredients. <clears throat> Probably loaded with fat. <clears throat> this uh, world today is filled with lying. Uh, Advertising is filled with lying. A while back, Sears Roebuck was uh, taken to call. Uh, because they advertised, I believe it was a six-piece kit of tools for so much. There's only five tools there. How's it six? Uh, <clears throat> they told the investigators, uh, that's counting the plastic case they come in. Six-piece, uh, counting the case that comes in. You see that? <clears throat> uh, listen, uh, a while back in March, I put a tricycle together for my granddaughter. And <clears throat> my son-in-law, who's an attorney, sat there and read the warranty. Uh, this warranty does not include normal wear and tear, uh, does not include abuse, normal wear and tear. My son-in-law said, what does it include? <laughs> Nothing. They guaranteed it to be a tricycle. <clears throat> it does not include abuse, normal wear and tear. Time he got through, they didn't guarantee anything. <clears throat> and by the way, all the parts weren't even there. You know what I'm talking about? <clears throat> There's lying and deception on every hand. You say, well... Uh, it's not as serious as it used to be. Oh, yes, it is. In the eyes of God, it is. I find in the scriptures when the Bible tells us in Deuteronomy chapter 34, when Moses died at 120, it says his natural force was not abated. He had the strength of a younger man and said his vision was not dim. That is unusual in that country because in that desert land, uh, most people by the time they got up of age in that bright sunlight, would, or their eyes were dim. You think about these old patriarchs. How many of them do you read about in the Bible <clears throat> that by the time they became old, their vision was dim? You can think of several. In that bright sunlight of that desert, uh, you didn't hear a man living to be 120 and his eyes just as strong as they were when he was young. My friends, this man in many ways is a type of God's law. You say, well, he's a type of Christ too. Yeah, he is. And I don't have any problem with that either because I turn on Channel 5 and John Wayne's playing a cowboy. I turn on Channel 8 <clears throat> and he's playing a Marine sergeant. I don't have any problem with that. Moses sometimes is a type of Christ, but sometimes he's a type of, of the law. And you can be sure of this, that God's moral law is just as strong as it was when God gave it. <clears throat> God views that law just as strong as he ever did. Uh, now, uh, our vision is dim. Uh, <clears throat> to us, stealing is not what stealing used to be. Our permissive society, that's a dilly. You know what that means? That means our fornicating society. That's what it means. Our permissive society, no, you mean our adulterous, fornicating society, uh, has watered this thing down, but in God's eyes it's as strong as ever. Thou shalt not commit adultery. You know how God looks at that? His eyesight's just as strong as it was when he first gave it. That's right. Thou shalt not bear false witness. You know how God looks at that? Just as strong as when he first gave it. When God says, thou shalt not steal, today we say, well, everybody steals. <clears throat> you know, everybody st steals a little bit. Oh, no. God says, thou shalt not steal. And God's vision of that's just as strong as it ever was. Now listen. <clears throat> he says here, God hates a proud look. He hates a lying tongue. <clears throat> and my friends, we need to consider that. First of all, God's people, we need to listen carefully when something's being said. Listen carefully. The American people living today, according to tests I've seen and surveys I've read, are the poorest listeners that have ever lived in this nation. A high percentage of the trouble among old Baptists is because people do not listen carefully. Listen carefully. Get the facts down. Because he says, uh, God hates a lying tongue. 
Hams that shed innocent blood. I wish I had time for all these, but I'm going to hit over a lot of them. But you can be sure God hates it. Feet that be swift and run into mischief. You know what that means? Uh, that means there's some trouble over here. And here's this person who's got to get over there and get in the middle of it to find out all about it. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, this mischief may be a church conference somewhere. And you either got to get over there or get the tape of it. Glad you came. Feet that be swift and run into mischief. Notice this, a heart that deviseth wicked imaginations. Brother, that's a big one in this year, 1991. Because I don't see how folks could watch TV today, listen to modern music, read modern magazines, and not have a problem with your heart wanting to devise wicked imaginations. There are men out in this world today having eyes full of adultery, which cannot cease from sin, that mentally undress every woman that goes by. Yeah. That's plain enough for you, isn't it? A heart that deviseth wicked imaginations. You can pick up most any woman's magazine in this country, and you find famous movie actresses and folks writing in there about their fantasies. You know, like folks ought to go through life fantasizing. You know, here's your fantasies you have. <clears throat> well, you better be sure that it's not a heart devising wicked imaginations. We read this. <clears throat> we go down this list. Hands of shed innocent blood. Uh, <clears throat> a false witness that speaketh lies. That's swearing that something is so when it isn't. I ought to give you a trick I learned from a lawyer years ago. I'm, I'm foolish for re revealing my tricks, but I'm going to reveal one. I learned this from a lawyer a long time ago. <clears throat> Somebody can start telling you something, and they're not sure it's right. And I've seen this hundreds of times among God's people. They'll come up and start telling me something about somebody, and you stand there and ask them, is that right? Oh, that's right. And they'll talk on, is that right? Oh, yeah, that's right. Uh, try this on them someday. Somebody starts telling you something about Sonny Powell. You say, is that true? Don't ask, is that right? Ask, is that true? I've had folks come up and start telling me something. I say, is that right? Oh, yeah, that's right. <clears throat> that tells some more. I say, is that right? After a while, I say, is that true? Well, now, uh, now, Brother Powell, I'm not a saying it's true. Uh, <clears throat> you know, just what I heard. Folks are scared of that word true. Try it. I try it. It works. There are folks who will stand there all day long and tell you something's right, but you start asking them, is it true? 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 And you watch it. <coughs> You'll knock the wind out of their sails unless they know it's true. A man who knows it's true <coughs> will roll right on, uh, <coughs> but that person that's not so sure will start trembling. They'll start backing down. Try it. It works. I use it all the time. Watch this. <coughs> a heart that devises wicked imaginations, a false witness is speaking lies. Let's go to the last one. He that soweth discord among brethren. Oh, you're going to love this one. <clears throat> that says God hates a person that sows discord among brethren. <clears throat> and I want to, I want to, stop, I want to stop, stop right here at this point. Uh, there are some brethren that I know among the old Baptists that I call primitive Baptist typhoid carriers. Uh, <clears throat> they want to be sure that I hear and know every BB that everybody's fired at me. Uh, they want to be sure that I know everything that everybody that they've been around has said about me. <clears throat> one brother came up to me one time and said, I hate to tell you all this, but I'd just like for you to know where you stand. <clears throat> I have some news for you tonight. <clears throat> if I go among God's people and I hear something that's life-threatening to Brother Jeff or life-threatening to you or you or you, I hear something that's life-threatening, I'm going to be a friend to tell you. In the 31st Psalm, David speaks of walking into a net that was privately or, or privately spread for him. <clears throat> and we have some good elders among, us, among the hard-shell Baptists and some you highly esteem, but I've known them longer than you would have. <clears throat> They're deceitful, capable liars. <clears throat> and they'll spread a net for a man. They'll spread a net for a man. Uh, a few years ago, they tried to uh, get me to help spread some nets for some fellows. Better listen to what I'm saying. <clears throat> Heed what I have to say. <clears throat> They'll spread that net for you, <clears throat> and you'll step into it before you ever know what happens. Uh, now, I'm, if I find that there's a net being spread for you or you or you or you, I'm going to come tell you. If there's something life-threatening in a campaign, something life-threatening going on against you, brethren, I'll let you know. Uh, but I do not intend to come up to you and tell you uh, every little BB that some little sister, some little brother popped in your direction. And I've got some news for you. I haven't got 30 seconds time for you to come up and tell me 
uh, what uh, Henrietta Hickenlooper said about my preaching here last year, Aunt Fanny Flapdoodle, or what old brother Roy Rumlover said, or what Elder Skimmel on Topwater said. I haven't got 30 seconds time for that. Because <clears throat> those people probably didn't mean it. They'd probably die heart failure if they knew you was telling me. And after all, everybody in the world really likes me. Trouble is, a lot of people haven't found it out yet. <clears throat> but I meet some people, they just feel like uh, that they've got to come up and tell you every little bee everybody popped at them. There's a dear preacher friend of mine, I highly esteem him, one of my, I <clears throat> love the man, and if I called his name, you love him too, those of you, if you know him, you love him. Uh, <clears throat> the man I'm talking about pastored a church for a number of years, and <clears throat> he told me several times uh, he had to drive about 30 miles down to where that church was. Uh, there was a sister who <clears throat> lived down in that area who was the self-appointed assistant pastor of the church. <clears throat> she lived right down in the middle of them. Uh, <clears throat> the good elder lived 30 miles away. Uh, the good elder told me, he said this time and time again, uh, he'd leave home on Saturday afternoon, you know, lifted up, high spirits, eager to get down there and preach to those people, <clears throat> and the good sister come up to him, and she had to inform him of everything that had been said since last month. You better go see so-and-so, because so-and-so said so-and-so, and so-and-so -so down here said so-and-so, and so-and-so -so, uh, -so took exception to what you said a month ago, and time she got through with him, he'd go in the stand, so cast down, he had a cloud over him. <clears throat> he finally called that sister, he said, let me fight my own battles. He'd rather go in, you, you preachers know what I'm talking about, he'd rather go in the stand with a clear mind and not know every BB been popped at him. <clears throat> because a lot of the folks that said it didn't mean it anyhow. You hear me? Yeah, you hear me. Uh, <clears throat> that's so in discord. And the Bible hates it. <clears throat> you say, well, we all do it. Sorry, God still hates it. Say, <clears throat> you ever do it? Yeah, I've done it in the past. I'll stand up here tonight and admit my sins. You want to come up here and admit yours? Uh, don't you go out of the building talking about me because I'm man enough uh, to say I'm not perfect in this respect. Every last person in this congregation has lived very long, has passed stuff on that caused that so discord. You know what? It, <clears throat> the fact still remains God hates it. God hates it. He that soweth discord among brethren. I want to uh, <clears throat> give you another way right fast that men can sow discord. We come to the 20th chapter of Acts, and the Apostle Paul gathers together the elders of the church at Ephesus. Verses 17 and 18, he talks to the elders of the church at Ephesus. Ephesus. Uh, he didn't talk to the reverends. There were none to talk to. <clears throat> he gathers together these elders of the church at Ephesus. And in verse 28, he says, Take heed unto yourselves and to all the flock. Whether the apostle Paul is talking to one preacher or a group of them, he always tells them to take heed unto themselves before he tells them to take heed unto the flock. You ever notice that? In writing to one preacher, Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 4, he says, take heed unto thyself and to the doctrine. Over here he says, take heed unto yourselves unto all the flock. <clears throat> a man who does not take heed to his own personal life, a man who does not take heed unto the way he lives, is unfit <clears throat> to feed the flock of God. That's right. He's unfit to feed the flock of God. My first responsibility is to take heed unto myself. Uh, <clears throat> the primitive Baptist people deserve clean food from the pulpit, but they deserve it from a clean plate. <clears throat> the Lord has not gotten so desperate for preachers that he's got to call homosexuals and child fondlers <clears throat> and crooks and people like that into the ministry. That's right. I'll amen that myself. He's not that hard up yet. <clears throat> now listen. He tells these elders of the church at Ephesus, <clears throat> he says, Take heed unto yourselves and all the flock over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers. Feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. And watch this. <clears throat> he says, This know also that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among the flock. Grievous wolves. But what's this? Uh, <clears throat> and by the way, these are not grievous wolves out here in the so-called Arminian world. If you say, well, those wolves are out here in the Arminian world, then you're going to have to admit that the Arminian world is the true flock of God because the same flock the wolves are coming into <coughs> is the same flock they're told to feed. He's telling us wolves will get in among us. <coughs> wolves will get in among us. Did you catch that? Wolves will get in among us. Second Peter, uh, <coughs> Second Peter chapter 1, uh, the apostle Peter tells us here that as there were false uh, prophets among the people, there'll be false teachers among you, out in the so-called Arminian world, among you. See it? Okay, first of all, we've got grievous wolves. Next, he said, also of your own self. These men aren't grievous wolves, but they're still dangerous. Also of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things. Uh, <clears throat> these are men of our own selves, but they arise speaking perverse things. What's their motive? To draw away disciples after them. Uh, here's a man that comes up with something new. You know what his purpose is? 
<clears throat> so that people will think his thinking is deep in that subject. He's a specialist in that subject. And build a following. These men will arise speaking perverse things. You know what a pervert is? <clears throat> that's somebody that's different from that which is normal and accepted. <clears throat> you know what perverse things are? Here's the normal, accepted doctrine of the old Baptist that's been tried and true through the centuries. It's tested and true through the centuries. Here's a man comes up preaching something contrary to that. That's a perverse thing. Now then, listen to me carefully at this point. <clears throat> a number of years ago when I was very young, I was in the company of Patrick Henry Byrd, P.H. Byrd of State of uh, Twin City, Georgia. That man was the wisest and soundest man I ever met in my life. He lived to be 90, preached the gospel 70 years. He's head and show He was head and shoulders above any man living in the state of Georgia today. He was head and shoulders above any man living in the state of Texas today. It's a shame that he's only remembered for his wise cracks and such as this. He was a great systematic theologian. That old elder looked at me one time. <clears throat> he says, young man, you do not differ from the standards of primitive Baptist on one point, not one. Well, that means a lot to me. But you do not differ from the standards of primitive Baptist on one point. He said, a man should think seriously, he should think carefully before he goes against what the standards of our people have taught for generations. He went on to say, he said, I do not mean your local ministers. They may be wrong. He said, I don't, I don't mean the ministers of your day and age. They could be wrong. But he says, when you look back at what Baptists have taught through the centuries, and you're about to go against it, think seriously. Because listen to this. In the Bible, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 15 and 16, he, sa he tells young Timothy, he says, That thou may know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of truth. How can the Lord's church that he built nearly 2,000 years ago to be the pillar and ground of truth and be wrong for centuries? Oh, I'm very well aware that error has crept into the church in the past, but you know what God did in every case? He raised up sound men to pull the church back into line. Uh, in every century that the church has been on this earth, I could find some error of some kind, but you know what I also find? I find sound men <coughs> being raised up to pull God's people back from those extremes. How can, the Lord, how can the church be the pillar and ground of truth and be consistently wrong on something? <coughs> and any time, my friend, you're tempted to come up with something that has not been the historic teaching of our people back through the generations, uh, think seriously before you present it. <clears throat> I am not conceited enough. I am not conceited enough. I'm not arrogant enough to believe that God would hold something back from the church for over 1,900 years and then finally reveal it to Sonny Piles in the latter days. For a man to say <clears throat> that here's the Lord's church, which is the pillar and ground of truth, the pillar and ground of truth, and that the Lord has hidden something from the church over 1,900 years, and you cannot find where anybody in the past ever taught it. <clears throat> and now the Lord has revealed it to some little uh, <clears throat> preacher over here in the latter days. Uh, <clears throat> that little fella is so conceited that his ego come, would make Mount Everest look like a little uh, anthill. And you tell him I said so, okay? Tell him I said that. <clears throat> it's the height of conceit to think God would reveal something to you that he's hidden to, uh, from the church for over 2,000 years. Now listen, <clears throat> he that soweth discord among brethren, uh, there's all kinds of discord being sown among God's people today. And you know <clears throat> uh, the basis of it? <clears throat> Somebody wanting me to do something new, something novel, something new, something novel, <clears throat> gender strife, uh, <clears throat> cause division, and my, may I say to any preacher that's, uh, that's of this mindset, uh, here's what's going to happen to you, sir, and I could name a whole bunch of specific things that are being taught among our people. I could get specific and almost would. Uh, um, uh, might do it tomorrow night. That'll grant a, get a, give us a big crowd tomorrow night, won't it? I might get real specific tomorrow night. Who knows? Uh, uh, anytime you're tempted to teach something like that, sir, here's what's going to come to. God's people are not going to have it. That's right. They're not going to have it. Because these old Baptists out here that some people think are so dumb, uh, they might not uh, be able to quote you 150 scriptures, but they know when it's preached wrong. I've known a lot of folks across this country. <clears throat> they couldn't explain it to you right. Uh, I pastored some of them for about 28 years. <clears throat> they might not be able to explain it to you right. They might not be able to whip you in a debate. But brother, you preach it wrong, they'll catch it. Uh, they're going to catch that uncertain sound. 
And regardless of all I can do and your buddies can do and everybody can do, those folks are not going to have it. <clears throat> Next thing you're going to do, you're going to run out of a place to preach unless you split a church. <clears throat> and if you split a church, you're sowing discord among God's people if you split a church. All right. Now listen. He says here, <clears throat> uh, God hates what? He hates that person who sows discord. May I ask you tonight, what is wrong with those things that are most surely believed among us? What's wrong with it? <clears throat> May I say tonight, uh, we have folks all over this country that are introducing things that they think will put the old Baptist church on the map. <clears throat> the old Baptist church grew more in the 1800s and the early 1900s <clears throat> on just old plain primitive Baptist salvation by grace. Uh, it grew more on that than it is today. If I were to draw you, and by the way, uh, it's told today that if every church will meet every Sunday, our churches will grow. I'll take on one primitive Baptist preacher, I'll take on all of them. And I'll prove to you that historically the old Baptist church grew more meeting once a month than it's ever grown in history. Somebody, uh, somebody says, you saying we ought to go back to meeting once a month? No, but we ought to go back and find out what they had meeting once a month that we've lost somewhere along the way. <clears throat> you say every church ought to meet every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, and every Wednesday night. Really? I have a chime clock at home at Graham, Texas, that I turn off when I have company. It'll keep you awake, but I've listened to it till I don't hear it. <clears throat> now listen. If I were to draw you a chart tonight, and this won't come across on tape, you ought to have been here. If I were to draw you a chart of the churches that I have surveyed and studied in this nation that were constituted from the time our people landed in this country till the Civil War, it, it would stack up that high on my chart. From the Civil War to 1900, about that high. And from 1900 to the present, with our radio broadcasts, <clears throat> our tapes, our Madison Avenue Hollywood professional young preachers, <clears throat> with our fine buildings, <clears throat> with all that we have today, churches constituted from the beginning to, to the Civil War, that high. Civil War to 1900, that high. 1900 to the present era, that high. I can make that stand. I can make it stand. <clears throat> and someday folks are going to figure out what I preached to them about 11 years ago. I can produce the tapes. That Jewish harvest went through three stages. The first fruits, the main harvest, and the gleanings. I preached that 12 years ago. But that opens up another subject. And it won't take you five minutes of Bible study to figure out what the first fruits were. That was Christ and those people in the early days. Uh, <clears throat> but anyway, and uh, when you brethren start building these 500-member churches and you get this big revival going, I'll come back and eat crow. I offered to eat crow 12 years ago, first time I ever preached that, first fruits of the harvest, the gleanings. I offered to eat crow in the present about 15 preachers. They haven't prepared my crow yet. Because all the hard shell church has done in the 12 years since I preached that, <clears throat> down, 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 split into sawdust. Down, 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 down. Preachers declaring war against other preachers. Down, 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 down. That's all it's done. <clears throat> despite radio broadcast, uh, despite full-time, fully supported preachers, despite, 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 down she goes. <clears throat> and it'll keep on going down until a few things are changed. And might get into that tomorrow night. What's this? God hates those that sow discord. He hates to sow a discard right fast. <clears throat> I find in the scriptures, let's come over here to, I want to come to Malachi chapter 2. <clears throat> now let's just make a lot of people mad. I know you're glad you came. People so or else I feel like I wasted my time. Well, come over here to Malachi chapter 2. Uh, <clears throat> and in that day, it was popular among the Jewish men to divorce their wives for any trivial reason. Malachi chapter 2, verses 14 through 16. Uh, he begins to warn them about uh, the wife of their youth and forsaking that covenant. That's the marriage covenant. That's not God's everlasting covenant. That's the marriage covenant. Look at that context. He tells that old Jew, you've dealt treacherously with the wife of your youth. Uh, he tells that old Jew in Malachi 2, 16, the Lord hateth putting away. That says the Lord hates divorce. You ready for that? Okay, we're talking tonight about things God hates, first of all, things God hates. We come to the 19th chapter of Matthew, and while the Lord was preaching on this earth, there were two main schools of thought among the Jews pertaining to divorce. 
Uh, there were two powerful rabbis among the Jews. One was Rabbi Hillel. He taught a lot of folks. There was Rabbi Shammai. And <clears throat> both of them had quite a few students. One of these rabbis uh, <clears throat> held to the very loose view. He was very liberal. According to <clears throat> one of these rabbis, uh, that Jewish man, if he caught his wife spinning in the streets, if he caught her with tousled hair, if he saw her going up a flight of steps in front of a man, uh, if she burned his biscuits, anything he didn't like, uh, he just wrote her a bill, bill of divorcement and put her away. I have at home photocopies of some of these old <coughs> Jewish bills of divorcement. Uh, <coughs> just write her a bill of divorcement and put her away for any cause. Uh, burned his biscuits, <coughs> didn't like the way she fixed her hair, <coughs> out here spinning in the streets, just name it, he could put her away. Uh, the other school of thought was very rigid. Sound like anything new? Bible sure out of date, isn't it? Oh boy. <coughs> we have the liberals and we've got the hardliners. We have another school over here. All they recognize is death. Uh, <coughs> other school over here is very rigid on it. Now they come to Jesus Christ and watch this. They're coming at him with a double barrel shotgun. Uh, <coughs> if he answers this way, uh, <coughs> he'll make Shammai's uh, uh, disciples angry. If he answers the other way, he'll turn Hillel's disciples against him. You see this? Now watch how they come at the Lord. Matthew chapter 19. They ask the Lord the question. They say, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? Notice what the Lord tells them. <clears throat> he says, have you not read? You know, there's a good example right there. Uh, <clears throat> when you find old Baptists fussing and having a controversy over something, you know the best thing to do? Put them, put them to reading. You know, did you catch that? He said, have you not read? You know what he told them to do? You need to read more. And usually when you find people out here, uh, they're fussing and carrying on, uh, somebody quit reading. At least going back reading what God said to put you in a more humble mood, put you in a more spiritual frame of mind. Uh, he says, have you not read how that God at the beginning made them male and female? He sends us right back to the book of Genesis. He made them male and female, and God said, what God had joined together, let not man put asunder. Uh, did you notice that in the first family God put on earth, God made no provision for divorce? Did you ever notice that? He didn't say anything about it. He joined them together, and uh, I hate to use this word, but it seems that the presupposition or the assumption is they're going to stay together. God made no provision for their divorce. <clears throat> he says God at the beginning made the male and female. God said, what God had joined together, let not man put asunder. Now listen to them. They said, uh, well, why then, why then did Moses command that you write a bill of divorcement and put away your wife? Divorce was first introduced in Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 1. There was never any divorce before that. They say, then why did Moses uh, command, allow us to do this? Uh, listen to this real carefully. <clears throat> he says, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your eyes, but from the beginning it was not so. Hang on here. If everything, if everything is predestinated and unchangeably fixed, the foundation of the world from the beginning it was so. Have I lost you? Here's something from the beginning wasn't this way. You catch it? Yeah. <clears throat> now, if God has fixed it this way from all eternity, it's got to be so. He says from the beginning it wasn't this way, but from the beginning it wasn't so. This was not God's original design. That's what he said. <clears throat> In fact, if you take your Bible to James chapter 3, James says a... Uh, uh, out of this mouth with curse, out of this mouth with bless. He says there's no fountain sends forth at the same time bitter water and sweet. Uh, he says blessing and, and cursing proceeding out of the same mouth, these things ought not so to be. There's things in this world ought not so to be. If God has predestinated and unchangedly fixed all things, all things ought so to be, but there's things in this world ought not so to be. <clears throat> he says uh, God suffered you. He suffered you because of what? Now wait a minute. The Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, summarized the cause of every divorce in four words. Uh, now, you can go down here and talk to the marriage counselor, talk to a lawyer, take it to the courthouse, and they'll write them up on irreconcilable differences. That's a dilly. <clears throat> irreconcilable differences, incompatibility, Lord knows what. Uh, you can go down to the marriage counselor and plead 50 different causes. Uh, maybe go down here to the judge and plead all kinds of things, but Jesus boiled the cabbage down in four little words because of hardness of your heart. Hardness, watch this, hardness of your heart. You say, well, you don't understand. Uh, you say, my husband left me and took out after another woman. His heart became hardened. You say, my wife left me for another man. Her heart became hardened because. <clears throat> Here's that couple once upon a time stood before the preacher or the judge. 
and they made their vows, at that time their hearts were tender, or they shouldn't have been getting married. And by the way, <clears throat> this is an admonition to every married person in this congregation, myself included. You know what we should work toward? Uh, avoiding hardness of heart. Uh, <clears throat> as we go through life, let's do everything we can to keep our hearts tender one toward another. Uh, <clears throat> these vicious words are uh, one of the stupidest statements made in the foundation of the world. And <clears throat> you say, hey, you shouldn't say stupid. All right, I can use something worse. It's still stupid. Folks will tell me, say, my wife and I like to fuss because we enjoy making up. That's ridiculous. What are you, a moron? <clears throat> I, don't, my, I don't like to fuss with my wife <clears throat> because she's got a fantabulous memory, and so do I. <clears throat> and it's liable to crust over and look ever so smooth. <clears throat> then 20 years later, you catch it? Yeah, you know what I'm talking about, don't you? You know real well, don't you? <clears throat> yeah, <clears throat> you have. Uh, it's better not to fuss to start with. It's better not to use these harsh words. <clears throat> it's better to do everything you can in your power to not call her the, the old woman or the old lady or not call him my old man. It's better to do everything you can to keep those hearts tender. <clears throat> because that heart can become hardened before you know it. It can. Uh, that's why the Bible says, uh, Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. That's why it says we're to avoid bitterness. Uh, what's this right page? Uh, you say, well, you don't understand. You say, I had a man once upon a time used to come in, beat me, and knock my teeth out. It took a hardened heart to do that. It took a hardened heart. I'll still stick with what the Lord said. <clears throat> Somebody's heart became hardened. Uh, keep your heart tender. He says, because of the hardness of your heart, said Moses suffered there. Uh, said you were, uh, you were suffered to do this. Oh, did you catch that? Suffered. Remember what I tried to talk to you about last night about the long suffering of God? God's not the author of sin. He doesn't permit it, doesn't allow it. You know, none of that stuff. He long suffers it. <clears throat> Here's something else God suffered to be so. But Jesus, what's this? Jesus says, but from the beginning, it wasn't so. It wasn't this way from the first. Now listen to what the Son of God said. <clears throat> he said, here's what I say unto you. Hillel says this, get it? Shammai says this. <clears throat> here's what I say unto you. And you know all I'm interested in tonight? I haven't got five minutes' time for what Pink or Spurgeon or Calvin <clears> or <throat> folks up the past said. Oh, I read them out of curiosity. But if one, when it comes down to settling a matter, I want to know what the Lord said. <clears throat> I read those men, but there's one thing about it. They put on their pants one leg at a time, just like me. <clears throat> the Lord says, But I say unto you, Whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, <clears throat> and says, Marrieth another, committeth adultery. And whosoever marrieth her that's put away says, that person commits adultery. You say, explain that to us. <clears throat> Listen, when I joined the Old Baptist 40 years ago, that was clear to most Old Baptists across this country. It's not clear today. It was clear when I joined them 40 years ago. Uh, <clears throat> there's a lot of things in the Bible are real clear if you want to obey it. <clears throat> I never met a boy in my life who wanted, who wanted to obey 1 Corinthians chapter 11 that ever asked me how long is long, you know, about your hair. A man, a boy, who, a young man who wants to obey that, reads it, and he doesn't have any questions about it. You know, the only fellow that has any questions about it, somebody who doesn't want to do it. <clears throat> any God-fearing woman tonight can read God's Bible and find out what the woman's place in the home is and the woman's place in the church. And <clears throat> my mother never had any questions about it. My wife's mother never had any questions about it. I could name you a lot of old Baptist sisters across this nation never did ask a preacher a question about the woman's place in the home or the woman's place in the church. <clears throat> because if you read the Bible wanting to obey it, it's clear. <clears throat> you know the only people have questions about it? <clears throat> it's the little she bulls that don't want to obey it. That's right. <clears throat> it's amazing at things in the Bible that are crystal clear if you want to obey it. <clears throat> when folks want to obey what the Lord said in Matthew 19 pertaining to divorce, it's clear. Uh, when they don't want to obey, uh, obey it, it's not clear. The provisions the Lord made, <clears throat> and I'll say this tonight, the things I'm talking about were clearly understood among old Baptists 40 years ago. They're not clearly understood today even among some of our leading elders. <clears throat> but they're clearly understood where I pastored for 28 years. And <clears throat> while I'm on this subject, uh, in God's Bible, you find that the Lord gave this cause for breaking up this union, death, which is common to all. Roman, uh, first, if you want more information, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, Romans chapter 7, verses 3 and 4. Uh, marriage ends in death. You don't have to explain that to intelligent people. <clears throat> the other cause is right here. 
Matthew 19. Uh, while I'm at this point, I want, I want to throw something else at you. The Bible says in the fifth chapter of Ephesians that there are, there are people who have no inheritance in the kingdom of God and of Christ. Go over there and read about them. <clears throat> Fornicators, unclean, covetousness, says they don't have an inheritance in the kingdom of God and of Christ. Uh, you make that the eternal glory world, you've got all kinds of problems. But there are people that the Bible says have no inheritance in the Lord's kingdom here. They don't have an inheritance. Listen to me. I preached this to folks all over the country, and I preached it in the pulpit of my home church for 28 years. Anytime you take somebody that the Bible says has no inheritance, and you're going to force an inheritance on them, you're going to make an inheritance some way. Some way, somehow, uh, you're going to fix an inheritance in God's kingdom for that person. Remember what I'm saying tonight, and may it haunt you. When somebody has, when the Bible says they have no inheritance, <clears throat> you're going to give them an inheritance anyway, that person will eventually give you trouble. You'll eventually have trouble with them. <clears throat> you give an inheritance to a fornicator that the Bible says has no inheritance, you'll have trouble with that person. Uh, you may not have to deal with that person down the line because of fornication, <clears throat> but you'll have to deal with them for railing or sedition or something. Uh, there's a preacher excluded monk from our people a number of years ago. He was excluded from our people a number of years ago and ought to have stayed excluded because he wrote himself a one-way ticket to the end of the line. <clears throat> but there were some folks made the arrangements to get him back in. <clears throat> God's people have had to deal with it. Not on that thing. You know why? Uh, <clears throat> in the years that he's been back among God's people, he's tormented God's people on a doctrinal point. Tormented them on a doctrinal point. From what I hear, <clears throat> finally folks have had to fish or cut bait. You know what happened there? <clears throat> Here was somebody who had no inheritance. And some people decided we're going to give him one anyway. <clears throat> and folks have had nothing but 36 years of trouble out of it. And who it is doesn't matter. It's the principle I'm trying to advocate. It's the principle I'm trying to get across to you. <clears throat> All right, what's this? We find that the book says, you say, well, uh, <clears throat> you're hurting my feelings because I've been divorced. Uh, you're hurting my feelings because my daughter's been divorced. Well, I've never been divorced, and my daughter hasn't been divorced, at least none of us, none of us yet. <clears throat> but there's one thing I want you to understand. If I ever get a divorce, God forbid, and if my daughter ever gets a divorce, God forbid, or your daughter ever gets a divorce, God still hates it. <clears throat> Sorry, that's the way it is. <clears throat> this is something God suffered. You say, well, this hurts my feelings because I've got a lot of divorced people in my family. If I wind up with a lot of them in my family, God still hates it. It's not God's way. If you're married, stay married. And if you're not married, think seriously before you get into it. Uh, read 1 Corinthians chapter 7 about 85 times before you get married. Now listen. Uh, <clears throat> there are doctrines in the world God hates. You say, oh, that can't be true. Uh, we're living in a day where people are broad-minded, they're tolerant. Uh, there's doctrines in the world God hates. Oh, yeah, there are. Revelation chapter 2, verse 6, here's the people over here <clears throat> that the Lord praises this church at Ephesus because they hate the deeds of Nicolaitans. Uh, drop down to verse 15. <clears throat> he says, you have them that there that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I also hate. Someone might say, well, that, uh, that's kind of hard uh, <clears throat> because, uh, you know, it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you're sincere. It doesn't matter what you believe. You know, God loves all of it. David says in the 119th Psalm, verse 104, David says, uh, <clears throat> through thy precepts I get understanding. David says, I hate every false way. You say, well, I don't hate error. I don't hate, you know, a heresy. Uh, David did. <clears throat> he said, I hate every false way. There were also people in this world David hated. Uh, <clears throat> David uh, says in Psalms 139, verses 20 and 21, he says, do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee? You say, well, God's people shouldn't go through the world hating. David says, do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee? He said, I hate them with perfect hatred. You say, well, preachers are supposed to <clears throat> love all kinds of men. Not so. Uh, you turn over here to the qualifications of the ministry, and it says that that bishop or elder must be a lover of good men. It didn't say <laughs> he's got to be a lover of <clears throat> wicked men. It says he must be a lover of good men. People get some strange ideas, don't they? Now then, uh, we come over here to the 15th chapter of Matthew, and Jesus said to those people, says, This people draws nigh unto me of their mouths, said they honor me of their lips, but they said their heart is far from me. In vain they do worship me. Why? Teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Here's vain worship. Uh, you'll find in the 17th chapter of Acts, ignorant worship. Remember Mars Hill? The Apostle Paul points to that altar to the unknown God. 
and told those Greeks, says, you've got an altar to the unknown God whom you therefore ignorantly worship. You want to worship God in ignorance? I don't. You want to worship God in vain? Then we come to John chapter 4, the woman of the well at Samaria. And he tells that woman, <clears throat> he says, they are cometh in which the true worshipers. Well, wait a minute. If there's a true worshiper, there's got to be a false one. David says, I hate every false way. So does God. God hates every false way. You can be sure of this. He says, <clears throat> God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. You have here examples of doctrine God hates, and my time's gone. <laughs> and uh, in case I've got some of this by you, that there are things God hates, if you can see that. And in case you can see that there are doctrines God hates, <clears throat> let's try, uh, let's, now then, <clears throat> I mean, let's shoot for the moon. Let's see if you can take this one. According to the Bible, there are things God hates. There are seven of them in Proverbs chapter 6. You find some more in Malachi chapter 2. Hates putting away. There are things this world God hates. Uh, there's doctrines he hates. Remember the doctrine of the Nicolaitans? Deeds of the Nicolaitans? Uh, <clears throat> God hates false doctrines? Now let's try something else. According to the Bible, there are people in this world God hates. Amen. Now this is a rough part, isn't it? Now this is a rough part. Now you see, if, if somehow, Brother Jeff, or Brother Hewlin, some of you brethren, uh, Brother Barnard, I see him back there, uh, if you could get out in the world and somehow... <clears throat> slip it down somebody's throat like a pot of boiled okra and get them to acknowledge that there are things God hates and there's doctrine God hates. <clears throat> now we come to the hard part. There's people in this world God hates. We come to Psalms 5, verse 5. And <clears throat> David says to God, Thou hatest all workers of iniquity. There are people in this world God hates. Thou hatest all workers of iniquity. Finally, we come over here to <clears throat> Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9, we have a sentence that begins in chapter 9, verse 10, and uh, that sentence has got a parenthesis in it. It's got a parenthesis. What's this? Uh, and when Rebekah had conceived the one, even by her father Isaac, uh, that word even, Greek word kea, is the same word you'll find except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, means even the Spirit. Right. Yeah, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, even the Father. Here the same word that you find John 3, 5, born of water, even the Spirit, is translated even. And when Rebekah had conceived the one, even by her father Isaac, it was said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger. That's the sentence. <clears throat> now let's look at what the Holy Spirit put in parentheses. He says, the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil. You see that? Uh, not of works, but of him that calleth, that the purpose of God according to election might stand. Every Bible reader knows that the Apostle Paul here <clears throat> is talking about something in the life of Isaac and Rebekah before two boys were ever born into the world. Their names are Jacob and Esau. Uh, and when Rebekah had conceived by one, even by her father Isaac, it was said unto her. Go back to Genesis chapter 25. Uh, this uh, young woman, Rebekah, is carrying twins in her body. And to her amazement, Genesis 25, 23, these twins are fighting each other before they're ever born. And she inquires of the Lord. And the Lord says, Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. Uh, <clears throat> he says that one people be stronger than the other, and the elder shall serve the younger. God says there are two manner of people. And please, uh, folks, preacher friends across the country, hear ye, hear ye. If, since God says there are two manner of people, don't strain every leader in your neck and write a big article in the paper trying to make them one. God says there, thank you. <clears throat> thank you. God says there are two manner of people. There are two manner of people. Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. God says there are two manner of people. Just leave it like that. There are two manner of people. And that was true before they were ever born. <clears throat> there's, only one, there's only one infant in the Bible that you can prove to the Bible that God hated while he's an infant. You ready for it? Did you catch my statement? There's only one infant in the Bible that you can prove God hated while he's an infant. That's this one right here, Esau. <clears throat> you say, what if he'd have died that way? You'd have an infant dying in infancy. There was no way he could have died in infancy. You ready? <clears throat> God said before he was born, two nations shall be separated in thy womb. Uh, <clears throat> little babies dying in infancy do not beget nations. <clears throat> A man has to grow up, become grown, <clears throat> and get married to be the father of a nation. You know what the omnipotent God of this universe said? He said, I'm going to see to it that wicked Esau 
lives to be grown and begets a nation. There's no way he could have died in infancy. And if you don't like that, argue with the Lord. You know, when that book says the wicked have their portion in this life, don't say what, what if, but, 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 what if, hypothetical this, hypothetical that. Take it for what it says. <clears throat> the wicked have their portion in this life. Just take it and go on. When the Bible says the wicked are full of days, take it and go on. <clears throat> when the Bible tells you that every one of these that the Lord will say, depart from me into everlasting fire, they're workers of iniquity, take it for what it says. When it says the rest of the dead will judge down the books according to what their works, take it for what it says. Uh, when the Bible says God endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, <coughs> uh, a baby that dies stillborn, a little baby dies in infancy, a mentally retarded person is not somebody God endured with much long suffering. That's right. Think about it. Think about it. <coughs> a baby dying in infancy, a little mentally handicapped person is not somebody God's endured with much long suffering. And every person that will be cast into hell will be somebody God endured with much long suffering. You say, well, but, 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 what if, what if, what if, what if? I haven't got time for your buts and what ifs. Take what God's book said and let's go on. Now, you know what's one thing wrong with our people today? We're spending too much time with buts, 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 and what ifs. <clears throat> Just take what the book said and let's move. Now listen. They're fighting each other before they're ever born. Now let's look at the summary. <clears throat> After saying, and when Rebecca could see Boan, even by her father Isaac, it was said under there, the elder shall serve the younger. The summary is, <clears throat> Jacob have I loved but Esau have I hated. Now watch this, and this is real important. I know it's getting late, but I want you to catch this. If you don't catch another thing I say tonight. <clears throat> In Romans chapter 9, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the Apostle Paul is using a type of teaching that's one of the most effective ways to teach people. <clears throat> In those places, the Apostle Paul teaches something. He makes a statement. Then he says, this is what you're saying back to me. Uh, we, today we call it feedback. The Apostle Paul says, but some man will say, how are the dead raised up, and what body do they come? Uh, he anticipates, <clears throat> mind reads, what your objection is going to be and answers it. The Apostle Paul is teaching this way. He says, I said this, here's what you're saying back to me. Now listen very carefully. After the Apostle Paul said, Jacob have I loved and Esau have I hated, <clears throat> he tells you what type of response you're supposed to get when you teach that. And I say to any primitive Baptist preacher on earth, <clears throat> if what you're teaching on Romans 9.13 is not producing the response that the Apostle Paul says it's supposed to, you're all wet and off base. <clears throat> now let's try a few things. Some folks say, well, when he says he hated Esau, it didn't mean he hated him, just meant he loved him less. <clears throat> when you get out here and teach, Jacob, have I loved and Esau, have, but Esau, have I hated like you're supposed to, you're going to get this response. The Apostle Paul says, but <clears throat> what shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? When you preach the truth about that, people are going to holler at you. If it's that way, God's unrighteous. And if you're not getting that kind of feedback out of people, you're all wet, preacher. You're off base. <clears throat> now watch me real carefully. Watch me. All right, let's try this one. <clears throat> I am told that that means that he just loved Esau less. Doesn't mean he hated him, just loved him less. Oh, wait a minute. Everybody in this congregation has concepts of what it is to love people less. I love my wife more than any woman on earth. I just told you I love uh, you other sisters less. <clears throat> Are you saying, Brother Sonny, you're unrighteous, you're evil, you're wicked? Oh, no. If you've got any sense, you'll applaud me. <clears throat> because of, I don't mean out loud, but I mean in your minds. <clears throat> because a man better love his wife more than he loves other women. He better love other women less than he loves his wife. A man who loves other women seems he loves his wife <clears throat> is a scoundrel. Now I'm going to tell you that while I love children everywhere, I have a special love for my three. I'm telling you, I love your children less. <clears throat> Are you saying you're unrighteous, you're a low-down scoundrel? No, no. You expected it. Because the Bible says, He that provideth not for his own, especially they of his own house, <clears throat> hath denied the faith, and he's worse than an infidel. That says I'm supposed to have a love for my own, you're supposed to have a love for him, and however many of these over here belong to you that you don't have for other children. I'll go further than that. I have a love for my granddaughter. I don't have for any other grandkid on earth. And you're not saying, why well, you're unrighteous, you're mean and wicked. You expected that out of me, didn't you? I'd be a bomb granddaddy if I didn't. And just because I'm admitting to being a granddaddy, I'm not a senior citizen. I will never be a senior citizen. I'm a recycled teenager, and don't you ever forget it. <laughs> now listen to me. <clears throat> you say, well, let's see now. 
Uh, that uh, doesn't mean that he hated one and loved the other, but uh, some people say that, uh, and I'm going to have a hard time with this one. <clears throat> this, theory, uh, this theory is so much nonsense that I can't explain it in a sensible way. <clears throat> I, it's hard to make sense out of nonsense, but let me see if I can remember how this one goes. Uh, that doesn't mean he loved Jacob and hated Esau, but it means that uh, Jacob represents the flesh and Esau represents the... No, I got it back. How's it go? Uh, <coughs> it doesn't make any sense. Uh, <coughs> Jacob represents the spirit and Esau represents the flesh. Uh, but he just hates the flesh. <coughs> you keep on with that and you'll deny the resurrection of the body. Uh, Jesus is going to resurrect your flesh someday and <coughs> he's not going to resurrect something he hates. And he died to redeem you soul, body, and spirit. Well, none of these explanations, none of these explanations, you know, one's the spirit and the other's the flesh, and uh, the explanation that hate means love less, none of these is going to cause folks to holler back at you, well, if it's that way, Brother Piles, God is unrighteous. But I'll tell you something that'll bring that uh, down on you. Now, you preach it this way, and folks will start hollering, God's unrighteous, he's unfair. Uh, you get up and tell folks uh, that Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated, mean God means God loved uh, Jacob, and it means he hated Esau. And when you explain it that way, you'll get the feedback that the Apostle Paul says you're supposed to. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? <clears throat> That's the only explanation to that text that'll get that feedback. Okay, we come to the 12th chapter of Hebrews, <clears throat> and the Bible over here says, lest there be any fornicator, any profane person, such as Esau. He's called that a profane person. In the Bible, that means more than a cusser. <clears throat> you know what profane the Bible means? Leviticus, uh, no, uh, pardon, Ezekiel, 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 chapter 22, verse 26. Or Leviticus 10, 10, but let's go to, let's take Ezekiel 22, verse 26. God is about <clears throat> to reprimand, he's condemning the priest of Israel because they put no difference <clears throat> between the clean and the unclean. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> he said they put no difference between the holy and the profane. You know what the word profane means in the Bible? It means the opposite of holy. That's what it means. Everything that holy is, profane ain't. So you don't use ain't in the pulpit, it still ain't. <clears throat> Whatever holy means, profane means the opposite. The word holy means belonging to the Lord. You know what profane means? It means the opposite. All right, very well. Malachi chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. <clears throat> We find over here Esau, Edom, are a people against whom the Lord hath indignation forever. That's a long time in my book. Long time in my book. Now listen. Uh, I've got to close out. I've taken more time here tonight than I've taken in a long time, but I don't charge overtime. But uh, I'm gone this long, long time. I've been shortening my sermons lately, and folks have been saying, you know, over the hill, tired and all that. Well, I'll let you know there's life in the old boy yet. <clears throat> maybe, I, maybe I'm just doing this to show them, you know. Well, anyway. <clears throat> now then, what's this? In summary tonight, when I think about the severity of God and the hatred of God, uh, I'm not preaching on this tonight or trying to preach on it at least uh, because I'm some kind of sadistic person or because I enjoy things like this. I enjoy thinking about the love of God as much as you do. But the Bible tells me not to be lopsided. The Bible tells me that I'm to respect God. I'm to respect his name. The Bible tells me there's things over here that God hates, six things he hates, yea, seven are abomination unto him. <clears throat> what humbles me tonight and fills my heart with fear, I look at that list of things and I'm capable of committing them. You know what that teaches me? <clears throat> that teaches me to hate pride. That teaches me to want to tell the truth. Uh, <clears throat> that teaches me to want to try to stay out of mischief. Uh, that teaches me not to bear false witness. That teaches me to try to refrain from sowing discard regardless of how much we may have done so in the past. Refrain from sowing discard. When I find that God hates putting away uh, that teaches me to keep a tender heart and remember the vow I took toward a little girl about 34 and a half years ago. It also reminds me to teach the young people in my home church and wherever I go the seriousness of that union because God hates putting away. And when I come to the <clears throat> point that's hard to accept that there are people in this world God hates, you say, I don't understand that. That's a mystery. I've got a bigger mystery. The bigger mystery <clears throat> is that God loved Jacob. And I've seen evidence in my life God loves me, and that's a whopper of a mystery. That's a real one. <clears throat> May we walk in reverential fear of the great, uh, just, and holy God of this universe, and thank you for your patience, and may God richly bless you. Well, that's 
uh, <clears throat> Brother Johnson to close the meeting out. Come ahead, brother. 